speaks to the fact that after the first snow, it doesn't matter whether you're online or in person, it takes longer to get here. So, <laughs> stomp the snow off your feet to the brilliance of Serena Ryder. Serena Ryder, who if you were, say, old like we are, you would have seen her perform once, just her and a guitar, in the University Center at lunch. And people were walking around just eating stuff, at their Subway sub or whatever, and this tiny woman was like... <laughs> It was awesome. <laughs> cool. My day changed. I was like, I must stand here and go, wow. wow. Yay. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, everybody's late getting started today. So we're late getting started. And in fact, we um, uh, have planned for it with uh, a shorter kind of, you know, slide deck than usual. So we will not be rushing through any of this. Um, and we thought that since we're not rushing, um, we'll just do more stuff. So um, what we thought there's we could stories. do... There's stories. Well, there may there's or may stories. not be stories, but... Oh, there but will be... If you want stories... Only if you can come up with the perfect segue throughout the lecture, I will tell the story. So you have to, like, you gotta, you gotta Are plan... Are we talking about the one and the her and the her? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. That one? All yeah. right. No. Um, uh, let's start with some homework because I bet you I've on, received sorry. a few emails already about the homework. That. Yeah, screen grab that one because it's beautiful. Because nothing says snow day like a chameleon. <laughs> um, uh, so a couple of emails, some questions, some things, and we thought that um, this this homework in particular tends to kind of, you know. Um, uh, cause students to go, hmm, I have questions. So we thought we could kind of do a little bit of it together, if that's cool with you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear, it always pains me to clear the drawings, but I'd like it we does capture too, it. But as long but as we've captured it, I think we're, I think we're, okay. we're okay. So I'm going to clear yeah. the drawings. <laughs> ah, I hate that. Okay. Um, clear all drawings and uh, what we're going to... It would be more cruel to clear only somebody's drawings. Oh, that's if, if mean. They, like, if your color was judged to be like, Ugh, no. clear all. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, uh, polar bear. Um, gratuitous photo because yes. it's beautiful. But this one, I think... Is this yours? Yes, it is. And I think it's the cover of a book on polar bears. I think it's that one. It's not the cover of a book on Richardson's ground squirrels? No, it is not. <laughs> Same way. <laughs> I have to double check. The book is downstairs, but I think this one made the cover. And why? Because it shows that polar bears are not white. Yes, but why oh. are you looking at eye level? Ha. Shh. We got really close. That's not <laughs> smart. Not smart. Um, yes. Um, beautiful, right? But polar bears are not white. Uh, they are yellow. Um, some of them can be a little whiter than, than this one. This one was particularly yellow. And this um, is a Norwegian bear? This is a Norwegian bear. Uh, it is a Norwegian bear. I can You're tell. Right. You can tell. Yes, because yeah. he looks fishy. <laughs> um, but anyway, beautiful. Look at, look, at those, look at those claws. Like, they yeah. scare the shit out of me. Like, yeah. these, these things are just freaking terrifying um just wonderful and so at home and comfortable and confident in the world they're oh. just curious there's no there's no reason to for this beard bear to be f afraid of anything no. the, the the dominant <laughs> emotional response to novelty is curiosity yeah and then put it in my mouth <laughs> and so if it's you it's like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Don't want to go in the mouth. Nah. Okay, so homework, bears, awesome. By the way, I just gave you the perfect segue. And you... <laughs> but later, I didn't, I wasn't later. <laughs> start your story before the... Later, later. Let's do some homework together. Um, so if any of you would like uh, to um, use your text tool uh, in the annotation menu, um, to add something and then we will judge you. No, <laughs> we will evaluate it and discuss. Um, I think that would, uh, let's try it and see if you're up for, for doing that. If any of you, um, or if you want, uh, well, let's just wait a second and see whether or not any of you want to just throw up something in any of those squares. So we're, we're talking about specifically adaptations to the cold. Uh, about polar bears. So if you remember from the previous class, we talked about um, different, there we go. Well done, super good, yay. Okay, so see if you can fill it in. If if uh, if things slow down, I'll throw out some, but, um, but it would be cooler if you did it. Nice, nice. 
Okay, so there's a little correction here, which I love. Thank you. So somebody wrote hibernation at the organism and chronic. So hibernation is definitely at the organism, organism and chronic level. So well done. But then somebody has contributed to say that only pregnant polar bears hibernate during the winter, and that is a correction as well. Well done. Um, so yes. Um, and, uh, and so that's an important sort of polar bear specific modification. So, uh, that's, that's super good. Um, huddling and the acute and the population level huddling is definitely at the acute and population level. And I would correct it simply by saying that polar bears don't huddle together. Um, they are not social animals, um, and so you don't see that at the population level. What you do see it as, at is more at the organism level if you're talking about a mother and their cubs, and cubs in this, ex, in this context would simply be just um, an extension of themselves, right? Like a little tiny appendage. <laughs> um, but it certainly wouldn't be at the population level. With penguins, though, you're absolutely correct. Um, at the population level, huddling acute in order to keep warm is bang on, like perfect. Congregate in larger groups and larger, okay, yeah, again, so the congregation of the larger groups and everything at the population level is more characteristic of uh, an organism that doesn't form their own personal territories and defend them, uh, of uh, an organism that has like more of a social structure and polar bears do not. Um, and uh, we do see the occasional exceptions, of course, like in areas like Churchill where they do tend to congregate, but even then they're not like, you know, hanging out in groups, kind of talking to each other. They're just there by, by force, right? Because that's where their resources are, so they have to kind of get along. Um, but I would argue, um, and I think polar bear biologists would argue that it isn't um, a population, um, that, it's, that it's just this kind of concentration. Uh, mating season questions, curling into a ball, that's excellent, yes, shivering, sweating, panting at the cellular tissue level, but I would also put, um, I understand why you've put it there, I would put the shivering, panting, and sweating at the organism level, uh, but I do totally get why that's there. Uh, lies on its back with feet in the air to accommodate, oh yeah, for overheating, very good, I like it, I like it. Um, How many of these things did any of you do this morning when you looked out the window? <laughs> I curled up in a ball under my bed, in my covers, <laughs> and, and groaned. I groaned. Huddling, sweating, yeah. panting, <laughs> shivering. Yeah, super good. Po oh my goodness, I love the one in the bottom right. Polar bears diverging from brown bears. That's very good. Or, it's more cryptic, <laughs> polar bears diverging from brr. Brr bears. Own bears. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Super good. Increased cholesterol levels provide fat storage in the bodies Whoa. due to diet. These are these are excellent. These are really good. Okay. We're done. We're done. Yeah. We're finished. You're fine. Screenshot that because yep. that's fine. Small modifications that yep. I would that I would do here, but honestly, if like you provided this type of thing for you know for an answer, I'd be super super happy. Um, you know, super confident that you had understood those things. So well done, everyone. Okay, um, is there, are, are you like waiting for me to address or Smith to address one particular thing that you want um, before we move on? Do you want to put a circle around anything that you want us to specifically comment on? My dog is the opposite. <laughs> uh, there's a discussion about no snow in Windsor. Mating, okay, thanks, okay. Molecular After... acute, and I think that was, uh, yeah. Molecular After acute. Molecular acute. After consuming high fatty meals following hibernation, the kidney, kidneys remove salt. Yes, I, that's, that's, that's totally fine and totally accurate. It isn't specific to uh, an adaptation to the cold yeah. unless you talk about the fact that they're eating fatty, fatty foods in order to be able to keep warm. And then I would wonder whether that's a specific thing because really the only thing available is fatty foods. But anyway, but I, I, I get what you're going with and I, I think that that's really interesting. And again, like, so the questions, actually most of the kind of corrections that we've made so far are really about specifically answering the question of the adaptations to the cold of the polar bear rather than the way that you've classified them. You've done that super, super well. 
um, uh, here, I don't know exactly what's being, if fall metabolic weight rate will decrease so it can cope with fasting months. That's a really interesting question. And it's not actually the fall metabolic rate. It would be the summer metabolic rate yeah. because that, those are the fasting months for the polar bear. Um, and there is this kind of presumption that it's like a walking hibernation, but there's actually no indication of it. There's no evidence of this kind of this kind of significant drop in metabolic rate as a result of of um, of being in the summer during these fasting months for the summer. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later, so we'll totally get to that. Able to swim far distances, absolutely correct. Um, I don't think that uh, that would fall into an adaptation to the cold, though, for the bear, um, because yeah. it isn't a migratory ability. It's not like they're kind of swimming far distances to get away from the cold. That's that's there's a disconnect between those two things. It might be. I'll lay out on the table. It might become an adaptation to an environment that is no longer sufficiently cold, where that's it okay. has to migrate not north but south yeah. when, when it loses the ice to get to somewhere that's okay somewhere yeah. like churchill in the southern population of hudson bay yeah yeah okay but okay. so again what in general if you're studying from this and we've screen grabbed it a couple times the we have tweaked some of these things but um you're so, so let's let's allow you to tweak some of these things let's clear oh good idea and then repost based on our feedback if you think we're wrong put it back where where you put it originally come on <laughs> own it own it, um, but if you if you want to modify, then go ahead and modify. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this, and we'll give you another opportunity. If you wouldn't mind, you've generously done it. Let's generously do it again, and then we'll screenshot that one, and that's the one that we're going to share. Because you know, okay? repetition is a big part of learning, <laughs> especially for us smell-based learners. Feeding it into your head. Okay, clear all drawings now. Please go ahead and repost. Would be great. <laughs> I was waiting for them to like call it on us and like, said, no. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. We're done. Good. Yes. Excellent. I'm uh, stomping my feet still. You're stomping your feet. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a catchy tune, eh? Yeah. Wonderful. And so... I'm noticing that population levels are getting uh, are pretty bare and how oh, that's a pun um, but yeah so <laughs> I would argue that there are <laughs> that there are no adaptations to the cold at the level of the population for the polar bear have, have we got close captioning going I'm just no, noticing we totally don't that uh, I should. was I was gonna register that. that my eye rolls weren't showing yeah I'm sorry about that we don't have the closed captioning but you know what if we do the closed captioning it's gonna change the size of the table so okay. we'll put it on it, it as for soon sure come, as, as you as I you've seen so sorry it comes on in the uh, there thank you polar bears are solitary animals no adaptations at the level of population for the polar bear it's a blank row and that's okay yeah um, this is great Thank you. It would again be an interesting scenario to say, so take that, this is true, yeah. and then say if there's concentration of these solitary animals associated with climate change. Maybe that's a new thing. What happens? Okay. Thank you. This is great. Well done. Well done you. Okay. Put your right hand in the air. Pat yourself on the back. Thank you. That was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, I hope there it was informative. There shouldn't be anybody close enough for you to pat them on the back unless you're unless you're married to them yeah. or living with them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Screen capture. You got it? I think I have it. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Good. I love all of this. This is well done. Okay. I wish we could do this all the time, like homework and stuff together. I do. I bet I you guys do too. Yeah. I learn a ton. There's just so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So much like content. So much content. Yeah. Yeah. And we only get two lecture periods. Like that what's sucks. up with that? I keep yeah. on asking for a Friday and I know that that's weird, but like a Friday class would allow us to do this. Stuff. Just questions the whole Just time. Just questions. Yeah. Oh, so I think good. I might do that for 2700 next term. 
Yeah. Like lecture Monday, Tuesday, and, and, and Monday, Wednesday, and then just do yeah, like Friday, right. Friday stuff, right? Yeah. I don't know anyway. what I'll do with the content. If you like that proposal, tell someone because yeah. that would help. Like <laughs> higher than us. Yeah, tell someone higher than us. We have no control. <laughs> okay. The thing that we control is this Zoom. Is this Zoom, and I'm gonna throw That's a poll at you. So we ended off with a kind of. Things are in flux in... What? Who, who would we even tell? <laughs> Just run into the street. What I would like on Friday! <laughs> and then interesting observation before the poll. Could you argue that the solitary nature of the bear is the adaptation at the population level? To the cold? Yeah. Historically? I don't think you could do it anymore. Check out our multiple choice options on this slide. That's totally messed up. <laughs> A, 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 A. <laughs> don't worry. We're going to throw up. Um, uh, I'm going to think about this question. I think my initial is no, you can't argue it, but maybe you can. Yeah. Um, but anyway, here's, here's the, we asked you um, uh, what is important to consider. Uh, here's the poll. Don't write the answer. Um, um, what would be important to consider? Um, about who's gonna like take over the Arctic or if it's gonna take over or whatever. What's the most important piece of information? The answer is A, somebody said, but that's because all of them are A here. <laughs> so here's your <laughs> here's your Zoom poll. It's the end of the semester. We're it's we're a Henry it's it. a Henry Ford kind of thing. You can have whatever you want as long as it's a black a. one. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, let me just think about this though, because could you argue that the solitary nature of the polar bear is the adaptation at the pole? It is definitely an adaptation to like minimizing competition for food and resources and things like this. I, I, I would argue, I don't know if I would argue that it's an adaptation to the cold though. I have to think about that. An adaptation to their grumpiness? To their grumpiness, yes. Speaking specifically of males, largely, at that point. Uh, do I need to refresh the PowerPoint slide, the, the slides? Is there, like, a new insert? If you, there is. Yeah, okay, I'm excited about that. Okay. I hope it works. You know what, so I'm going to do that right now while they're working on it. Because and it's not let us resize the... It'll let us resize, exactly. And, and I'm putting on stop share. Um, I'll tell you what it looks like over here. Looks like all of us. Yeah. Hello. Um, okay. And then if I go and then relaunch it, right? I see it there. Yeah. I think it all needs me to do is to save it. I think. And as long as I save it here and it says save to drive. But if you're presenting, it doesn't present the changes. You have to stop the presentation. There we go. Good. Somebody had noticed it in the in the chat as well. What's that? The lack of the lack of closed cap. I am so sorry. Yeah. Um, the closed captioning will be available once it's posted to YouTube. And we can't. We have it now, right? And we have it now. And I'm. I. I apologize. Um, we for we not apologize. having it. We will continue apologizing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and screen share. Where are we with the? Okay, and we're good. Uh, no, actually, people are still voting. So get your votes in, and we will. 83%. Yeah, super close. I think um, we can pretty much stop it there because we're now running out of time. <laughs> and polling. Share results. Well done. So the answer is indeed which species has the range nearest to the Arctic. Was it A? Uh, it was A. No, it was A. <laughs> um, like the, f the, what, the second last A? The second last A. It was so. the second last A. That was the correct answer. A? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, which species um, has uh, the nearest range closest to the Arctic? I saw this clip I was like oh my god that's like the perfect clip uh, it's the perfect segue for this <laughs>
And, and after so, you see where we go, yes. You will so agree. let's take a look at um, the distribution of who's next door. <laughs> uh, so here are some data. Data! And um, it, poorly colored data, but data nonetheless. So everywhere that you see these um, gray cross hatching is the, is the range of the polar bear. We're not recording. We are. <laughs> yes, Sorry. we are. Sorry. Um, and uh, everywhere that you see, the, yeah, every see the, everywhere that you see the red cross hatching um, is the distribution of the brown bear or the grizzly bear or the tundra bear. It's all the same thing ish subpopulations, subspecies, who knows? It's in flux. Um, and so, yes. Uh, and one of the places where it becomes, um, where it is cl crystal clear uh, that we are immediately on the boundary or the border of that, um, of that distribution, literally like this, uh, is here in a place called Joe Haven. Joe Haven uh, was named after the boat called the Joe, which was um, uh, Amundsen's, an explorer, a Norwegian explorer, a European explorer, who came across um, to do the Northwest Passage and was the first to actually make it through. And the Joe actually is, the boat is in Joe Haven, is in that community there. Um, Amundsen's approach, um, he was, uh, um, I, I, probably a, you know, a, a had a bit of an ego on him, um, but the big um, thing about Amundsen uh, was his approach to polar exploration um, from learning from the local people um, and using the technologies that the local people had, which was why he was so successful, why he took the South Pole uh, as well as the Northwest Passage. Um, uh, was because he learned from the people that were adapted to the cold, uh, whereas some of the, the British explorers fared much less well because they thought it would be a good idea to, you know, bring ponies um, in order to, to, to explore the poles, and that was a big mistake. So, um, I, think, I think you need to specify that it was largely the English of the British of explorers. The British. It was largely the English ones that tried to enforce their ways that Scottish... People True. generally tend to get hired and taken along. Yeah. Did um, yeah 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 that's a did good better adapting. That's a good point. Yeah, super. Because they had been poorer and yeah. had to adapt anyhow. Yeah yeah yeah. Thinking of some of the Scots that did it, that it's true. Um, anyway, we digress because in Joe, if you go there, in Joe Haven, if you go there, um, you will see uh, outside of the houses um, evidence of both polar bear and brown bear hunting. Um, because they dry skins uh, uh, on these kind of A-frames that are outside of their homes, uh, and you see both uh, brown bear and polar bear. Whereas in most of the other communities that I've been to, it's, mo it's, it's polar bear that, that you see evidence of, of hunting. Um, but in Joe Haven, the, that border is becoming closer and closer. Those ranges over, are starting to overlap even, um, and so the people are, of course, hunting, hunting both species. So there's a couple of observations yeah. about the lead and tin filled food and I oh my suggested goodness. that somebody should ask you about your family association with uh... <gasps> Shit. Yeah, this is crazy. I we're gonna run out of time again though. I'm gonna keep asking you, you challenge me to ask you for okay. questions. So that's this all I'm is doing nuts. is like boop. Yeah, Spike so it. Franklin, Spike it. Franklin, right? We've, I'm sure we've heard of him. If not, check it out. Um, actually, more badass is Lady Franklin because she was aw she was totally badass. She was. Yeah, uh, but anyway, she did very little Franklin, shoe eating. <laughs> Franklin the Fool. Okay, so Franklin the Fool decides that he's going to go and discover the Northwest Northwest Passage. Um, and then we never hear from him again, okay? And I've been to some of the places where he definitely landed because he buried people there that died on his ship. He was poorly equipped, yeah. poor planning. It was a total, like, you know, British fuck up, right? Yeah. In terms of exploration. No no willingness to learn from other from Yeah, from yeah. other people, right? So anyway... One of the things that happened, and probably wasn't the ultimate demise, I will just put, I'll just put it there, was I, not the ultimate demise. Many of the rest of the world disagrees, <laughs> but explain why it's not. Was lead poisoning as a result of eating from canned food, right? The cans were actually sealed with lead. Um, and it was at a time where I don't think it, that was known not to do that, but the, I think the reason why 
the Franklin Expedition experienced lead poisoning was, was because that was the only thing that they were eating. Um, and they were eating from these cans that were soldered in lead. Anyway, it turns out that if you go back in history to find out who was the canner, the person that put that lead liner on it, it's, it's got my family's last name. <laughs> <laughs> which is horrible. Um, I don't think there's any relation because my family uh, is from uh, Russia and the Ukraine and this family was in, in Britain. Like, I don't think we have a British connection, but if we do, oh my God, that's even funnier. Um, that I've visited those graves on Beachy Island um, of the officers uh, that died due to lead poisoning and it is haunting as shit because not only are the graves there, right? You've been there too. Yeah. Um, but also cans yeah. of like the cans that killed them. And it's there. a national historical yeah. monument now. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so, so the things won't leave. They like won't you, go. And it, yeah, it's, there's a confirmation here is uh, wait, is this a tangent or are we still talking about bears to wait. which I responded? This is bear adjacent. <laughs> this is bear adjacent, but, but important. I think, I think it's important to bring into these things, yeah. the, the historical context. Uh, as well as, um, you know, and how the biology and everything. So, so the, the stuff about Joe Haven was not a tangent because it's important to acknowledge um, the, the relationship that these bears have with the human populations that are there. The story about Beachy Island, that was a total tangent. Okay, <laughs> but brown bears and, um, and polar bears. We need to dive into some of their biology because if these are the ones that are gonna, you know, if it's gonna be kind of a, a, a brown bear or polar bear um, competition, we need to understand their biology in order to make predictions about what um, what's gonna happen. So what do we need to know? We need to know a lot of things, right? Um, and it really, you know, you can kind of like weigh them back and forth and say, well, the brown bear is going to do better in this situation, but the polar bear is going to do better if this, this, and this. And you can kind of go back and forth um, to figure out who's going to be able to, to adapt to a changing climate, right? And here are some of those data, right? Some of those bits and pieces. So I'm going to stick my head in here and say this is one of the cases where we do want to know this for two different species and we we just switched between slides and said here is all of these dozens of things intimate population biology that we know about these species that's right this makes it unlike most species on the planet that we could do this it's, yeah but they're big and furry and oh, we tend to be scared of them vertebrate centered yeah sorry mammalians it's fine but it, this would be hard to this would be a tougher figure for me to figure out with like this would be what there'd be like two different kinds of wolf spiders one that would be in the temperate and one that would be still in the tundra and they'd be cool they'd be beautiful but we wouldn't know most of these things uh we would know they don't have paws i suppose we'd have to read <laughs> paws none okay although a wolf spider with paws would be would be awesome weird <laughs> okay so the other thing that is important is that though we have all of these data not all of them are relevant to the conversation Right. And this is really where like thinking like a biologist is important um, and sort of the training that we get as biologists isn't necessarily to know what's important, but also to know what isn't important in the conversation. Um, and so here are a whole bunch of data. So, you know, I'm sure you're kind of thinking, hmm, future exam type of a strategy. Right. So here are a whole bunch of things. Now let's try to figure out which ones are relevant. Um, and what are most immediately relevant to us actually may not be the ones that you might think. They're the ones that we've highlighted here. Um, most immediately relevant are their diets. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? But also their head structure. What do we mean by their head structure? What? Yeah. Check this out. Right? Is that okay? Does that does that answer it? Because I see it circled, and yeah, I, I hope that that's clear. If not, why don't you pop it in the chat, and yeah. we can continue that conversation there. We're gonna erase it off the screen as yes, we change please. slides. There we go. Okay. So polar bears eat. Uh, aren't their habitats overlapping? Yes. The ranges certainly are. Now it's getting it's getting much more overlappy than it has ever been. 
Um, okay, so we need to now take a look at, um, so we ha we've established the diet. We know that uh, brown bears have this like omnivorous diet where they eat lots and lots of things, right? They're generalists, they eat berries, they eat meat, they eat pretty much anything. Polar bears eat pretty much exclusively seal. Um, you know, uh, certainly 200 years ago, that's all they were eating. Um, and we're starting to see changes in their diets, which we can ask a whole bunch of questions about whether or not that's um, sustainable in any way. The important information about the polar bear with respect to its diet has a lot to do with its bone structure. Um, and uh, that's obviously the connection to physiology. Um, so uh, you can see the highlighted parts of this abstract here talk about morphologically distinct species that evolved less than a million years ago from the omnivorous brown bear, right? So it's kind of this recent addition to the world, to the planet, this new species. Um, it produced cranial morphology that is weaker than that of brown bears and less suited to processing tough um, omnivorous and herbivorous diets. And it's funny, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? When you see something with massive jaws, you think, oh, that's a super predator, right? That eats a lot of meat because you need to have these big muscles and these big jaws to eat meat. But that's actually not true. You need to have big muscles and big jaws to grind and process non-meat-based foods, right? So all of the things, even when you think about um, the, the line of, of um, the homo species, right, in primates, the, the big massive jawed ones, the ones that even had like a crest, a bone crest that had muscles that were attached down to the jaw, those were herbivores that were grinding, grinding all sorts of plant matter that needed these big jaws. Yeah. So the polar bear, in its specialization towards these rather soft diets of fat and some meat, um, uh, basically had their jaw structure reduced um, such that they no longer need to process those big kind of grinding meals and can basically slurp up fat with a straw, right? So that's pretty much what their bone structure turns into is this straw that allows them to slurp up the fat. Um, and they don't even eat, eat bones or anything, right? They're not crushing anything. They're just eating this very sort of mushy, squishy kind of diet. One of the things that, that grizzly bears eat a lot of in the, in the boreal are ants. And when they're eating ants, they're, they're processing soil and, and rocks all of the time because they just carve out big chunks of the ground in which there are maybe 70% ant. But it's a lot of that processing. You don't need the big uh, strength of that to process the ant. You need it to process the, and get around the fact that you're eating ground. We take a look at the actual structure and strength of the skull, you can see the evidence of it quite quickly. Um, what you're looking for is red. Red um, uh, means that there is sort of, the, the skull is experiencing a lot of stress and strain. So it's about ready to break, okay? And if we take a look at the polar bear, you can see these like different segments or slices. Um, and the, the skull itself is being put under stress, okay? So take a look at the brown bear and the polar bear uh, columns. And what you can do just by kind of squinting your eyes is recognize that there's a lot more red on the side of the polar bear, a lot more red um, than there is on the side of the brown bear, suggesting that the polar bear's skull is not as strong, okay? You're helping quite a lot, Carol. So when we think about that, and we think about the context of a changing Arctic, of melting ice, of increased vegetation in the Arctic as a result of sort of the exposure of these swaths of land, um, of the diet of the brown bear, of the diet of the polar bear, which is heavily threatened because the diet of the polar bear is on the sea ice, right? Is those seals that are there. With less sea ice, there are fewer opportunities to hunt, fewer seals. Seals give birth, not on land, but on sea ice. And so if we lose that sea ice, we lose the opportunity for them to be able to give birth. And so all of those things are threatening the polar bear. 
but the brown bear is kind of right next door and perfectly equipped to be dealing with an uncertain um, diet because it can pretty much eat anything. It's a generalist. Yeah. Um, so it's a real problem for the polar bear, this whole conundrum, and that's why your question, uh, the one that, that was put right next to the video, is perfect because that's the secondary question. We know from the previous class that we had that hybridization of these two species is entirely possible. Not only possible, that it happened, right, um, in a previous time. Um, and so we can ask the question about whether or not it could happen again. Um, here are some more data that you should take a look at um, and kind of practice interpreting. Um, but basically, this is the kind of the link between the um, problems associated with reducing sea ice, means that it's harder for the polar bears to get food. <laughs> um, it's harder for the polar bears to get food, um, which means that their body condition is going to decline over time. And body condition is this kind of this kind of loose term index, physiological index, to describe, you know, the ideal amount of energy reserves that your body has relative to how much you actually have. So it's a sliding scale is what I'm saying. Like sometimes of the year it's better to be fatter than it is in other times of the year. That doesn't mean that in those leaner times of year your body condition is lower because that's an adaptation of good body condition given the condi given the you know the environmental condition so it's it's this weird thing like I, I worked on it for my phd that was like my whole thing was to figure out an index of body condition and it's a complicated concept because body condition ideal um can change throughout the season okay but for polar bears, here's the body condition index on the left hand, uh, on the left hand side, on the y axis. Okay, and what they've done is they've compared body condition um, across different classes of polar bears, um, like different demographics essentially, um, and compared them across years. And that's a really good way of getting around some of the absolute problems with body condition, like the, the absolute measurements, is if you do it relative, right? So we can say in 1984, body condition was this. We assume that that represents an ideal um, uh, condition because look at 2000 to 2005, which was like when you were born, um, and this is now the body condition, right? Um, and we can see that there have been dramatic declines. Not only that, but in specific categories of, of polar yeah, bears, it's right? A rough time to be a female. Yeah. So which one, in terms of like predicting what's going to happen to the polar bear, which bar, which couplet is the most important to consider uh, when we're talking about the future of the polar bear? Go ahead and scribble on it. Suggestions already in the chat. Oh, good. Good, good. Yeah. That's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Is there another one that's also important? Yeah. Good. Okay. Excellent. All. I like all. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. There, for sure, and I, I, I think the most important one that we're not really highlighting is males for now. Males are, are really just, <laughs> oh, this is going to be, males are really just sperm transportation, right? Like in terms, of, <laughs> in terms of the context of this discussion, they deliver sperm, and as long as the sperm are healthy, it's okay, right? As long as they can do that. Now, males, if they can't walk the vast territories that they need in order to deliver that sperm to the different females, then that becomes a real problem. But more immediately, it has to do with the body condition of the females. So males as subadults. Yeah, males as subadults, but also females as subadults are more important to this conversation, more immediately important. Um, because the single, the single females, the solitary adult females, 
may be solitary adult females because they weren't in good body condition during the purple years uh, to reproduce at all. So they become an important category. Um, and certainly uh, the adult females with young. Um, and the consequence of these declines in body condition is that in 1984 or 1986, um, females were regularly having up to three cubs right, at a time, and rearing successfully two or three cubs. Now, it's pretty rare uh, to see the successful rearing of two cubs. Uh, we see more and more females that are able to still rear one cub, but certainly not in the numbers that they used to. Okay. And then, hybrids, right? And compost. And compost. So this is a baited photo, right? So somebody has put out this bucket of frozen fruit um, here on this in order to attract this growler bear or pizzly bear. Um, but uh, what it says here is this is just a few years ago that this photo was taken. Um, and uh, it is a hybrid between a grizzly father and a polar bear mother. So think about that, because that's not the story of the hybrid of the past. We know that the story of the hybrid of the past was about um, grizzly mothers and polar bear fathers, uh, because the mitochondria was, came from the brown bear, right? This is the opposite. Uh, and so the mitochondria would be from the polar bear in this particular case, okay? But it is a hybrid. It has a very polar bear-y face. You can see that, right? But it's got, it's like a little wider here in the cheeks. Um, the ears are very kind of polar bear-y in that they're very small. Um, and uh, the rest of the body is this kind of, you know, quite dirty mix of, of grizzly and polar bear. Um, it's a very healthy one, you can see, because it is extremely fat. <laughs> and that's good, that's high body condition for this particular context. Um, and uh, this is going to be happening more and more, of course, since they are so closely related. Um, now, it may very well be that this mix is in fact adaptive if the polar bear line is able to get some of the benefits of the grizzly bear in association with a warming, uh, with a warming Arctic and a diversification of its diet, right? If it can do that. Has it done it in the past? Absolutely, right? We have the mitochondrial DNA evidence of it, but we also have people saying, yeah, this has happened a lot, right? Just like, you know, the search for the Franklin ships where, you know, Inuit knew where the ships were and have known where the ships were and knew about the Franklin expedition. Nobody was listening until a few years ago. Um, and lo and behold, they were where people said they were. <laughs> the same kind of deal here. This is not a new phenomenon, right? This is something that people have been documenting um, for a long time. Um, and so it's not really surprising, especially, you know, because we know that it's been happening for thousands thousands of years um, that uh, that it's happening now and happening perhaps more frequently as a result of some of the changes um, in the sea ice distribution. So there's questions, uh, can these things be passed down genetically, like can the grizzly bear father pass down genes for a stronger job? For all of these things yes. to work, to, to, to link the, phys the functional to the ecological to the evolutionary, they have to be inheritable. And so that the jaw structure is yes, in this case, yes. Yeah. And they do produce viable offspring, which is another important point, right? So if like a mule and a horse, or sorry, a mule, like a donkey or, or um, what is it? <laughs> a horse and a donkey. A horse and a donkey yeah. makes a mule. Mules can't reproduce. That is not a viable hybrid. These are viable hybrids. So implications. So many questions. So many things um, are important to note. Um, and we thought we would just throw out some questions for you to be able to kind of, in your brains, kind of wrap it all together and bring it together into some kind of um, understanding about what might happen in the future, in your future, in your lifetime, with respect to the polar bear population. So does that make them the same species? And what I was typing was, it is, I think, remember when we talked about species back in the evolution part of the onion, and we touched on it again in, in ecology, the idea that two species must not be able to reproduce successfully is kind of a simplistic part of one particular 
uh, species concept, but the one that you were all introduced to, unfortunately, in high school, the biological species concept. And the truth of the world is that most, many species, and maybe most species of plant, can hybridize with something. And the, the, the presence of hybridization does not indicate that they're not, that they are the same species, that two species that you see and act differently on the planet aren't viable. All it says is there's the retention of some kind of ancestral trait. That's it. And because speciation is a process, that, and a process that can take tens, hundreds, thousands of years, you, we just might be asking it at a point in that process when the retention of that ancestral trait, successful offspring, is still retained. And so it, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. It's one of the cases where the species is a fuzzy concept, that it has fuzzy edges, just like polar bears have fuzzy edges. Fuzzy edges. Okay. Unless you enter through the mouth. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today. I thought it was fun. Yeah, and I didn't get to ask your question. You didn't. I. Um... There's a story. We'll tell you the story, but not today. Really? Not even in the... Not even in the, the office hours afterwards? Yeah. Maybe. We'll yeah. see. If lots of you stick around, maybe not. Maybe we will. Okay. Take care. Take care. Shovel out. And yep. we'll see you when it's 10 degrees Celsius on Wednesday. <laughs>